Hello, everybody. This is Professor Monty, and welcome to statistics. So what is statistics? Essentially, statistics is just the idea of getting raw data, numbers or non-numeric data, and turning it into useful information. So when we look at statistics, it's essentially broken down into two areas. So if we start with statistics, the two main areas of statistics, one is called descriptive, And just as the name implies, it's going to describe this. And then the other one, we'll just do another arrow kind of down here. It's called inferential. And what inferential statistics does, as the name, the root infer, it's to infer about a larger group or a later time. So we may get some information and say, hey, these people exhibit these characteristics. What would the larger group, would they still exhibit these same characteristics? Or we could say, hey, this happened this year. I wonder if we can make this and use it to predict something that will happen next year or 10 years down the road. So that's essentially how statistics is broken up. We're gonna spend the first part of this class talking about descriptive statistics. And then the last part of the class, probably two thirds of the class, will be talking about inferential statistics. So let's start off with this. Let's talk about this larger group that we're talking about. The larger group is called the population. And so the population is essentially all members we're interested in. If we're thinking about something such as an election and we wanna know who's gonna win the election, we may say, hey, my population is gonna be all people in the United States that are 18 and older. And then we might say, well, you know what? That's probably not the population of interest. I'm only interested in those people that actually are probably gonna vote. So now let's narrow it down. So now our population is actually all probable voters. So they've applied to vote. They're probably gonna go in and vote. And so now we've got a new population. If all the members we're interested in is everybody that's probably gonna vote. Well, we can't, obviously talk to everybody. So what we do is we take a sample. And the sample is just some of the members of the population. Fancy, we could call it a subset, but it's some members of the population. And if you wanna see a quick picture on that type of idea, let's do this. So let's say we've got this big box here and we've got just a bunch of dots in here and this is our population. Well, if we take say this one and this one and maybe this one over here, well, that's a smaller group of the group we're interested in, that would be the sample. So the sample are members of the population, it's just not all the members of the population. If we do take all the members of the population, that's actually called the census, which is what in the United States, we take a census every 10 years to try to find out about everybody in the population so that we can go and make decisions based on that. Okay, so if it's the whole population, it's called a census, but if it's just some of the population, it's a sample. Okay, so now there's some important things about the sample though. If you think about the sample, what it needs to be, sample must be representative of the population. So for instance, if I'm looking at the population, say we're talking about likely voters, and then my sample is just people 
maybe in the election that have stated that they're independents. Well, that's probably not going to represent in total how everybody's going to vote. So there's some things we have to do about determining if we can get this nice representative sample that actually represents the population. And so we'll talk about things we do, but for instance, if 40% of the population are Democrats, we would like to have 40% of our sample be Democrats and do something similar for each of the parties. So that's something that we would want to do. And we'll talk about some ways of sampling in the next two sections. So just a little bit later. Okay, so now let's talk about once we do this sort of idea, let's go back to the idea of inferential and descriptive statistics. And let's do an example of that so that we get a better idea of that. So what I'm going to do is let's try to paste in, these are a couple of problems out of the book, and we want to look at it. And what the question says, the way this book is laid out, right before the problems, it will say, hey, on these next problems, 1.5 through 1.20, whatever the problems are, this one says determine if this study that they're doing right here is inferential or descriptive. If it is inferential, let's say what the population is. So let's do that. We'll get some of the population and sample ideas as well. So 1.7, it says TV viewing times. Data from a sample of Americans yielded the following estimates of average TV viewing time per month for all Americans two years and older. The times are in hours and minutes. Q1 stands for first quarter. Okay, so that viewing method watching TV in the house, watching time shifted TV, et cetera. They got a bunch of different things and they're comparing the first quarter of 2011 with the first quarter of 2010 and what the change is. Okay, so that 0.2% change means there's a 2%, 0.2% rather, increase in 2011 from what it started out in 2010. The 12.2% change, 12.2% change in 2011 versus 2010. Okay, first question, is it descriptive or is it inferential? Well, we, we sort of need to read to determine. So let's say, it says data from a sample. So right away we know it's a sample, right? Because they didn't talk to all Americans. They didn't talk to me. They probably didn't talk to you either. So it can't be a census, can't be all Americans. But data from a sample of Americans yielded the following estimates of average TV viewing time per month. Just this little word here, estimates. So what they're doing in this is they're saying, hey, we took a sample. We think this is an estimate of all the people, all the Americans two years and older, how much TV they watch on average. So as soon as they say we're estimating, they're estimating the entire population so this becomes inferential. Because they're not saying, hey, out of the people we talked to, this is the average. They're estimating for all Americans. So it's inferential about all Americans. The population here, and what did they say? Data from a sample of Americans yielded the following viewing time per month for all Americans two years and older. So the population, all Americans, two years and older. The sample was just those Americans two years and older that they actually, I'm just gonna say the Americans, that were okay so let's go on to the next one 1 1.8 says professional athlete salaries from the statistical abstract of the united states and the article average salaries in the nba nfl mlb and nhl by Jake Dorsch, published on the Yahoo Contributor Network, we obtained the following data on average professional athlete salaries for the years 2005 and 2011. 
So they give us the salaries for each of those three. I'm not sure why they said it. Not, um, but they give us the average salary in 2005 and 2011. And the question is, is this inferential or is this descriptive? They're not inferring about any larger group or any later time period. So this is just a descriptive statistic. And notice, anytime it's descriptive, they're not going to ask you with the population and the sample because they didn't sample a larger. This is the athletes in baseball, basketball, and football in those pro sports. So it's descriptive. They actually did take a census here because that's all of the ones in those sports. Okay, so we don't have to go any further from there. So that's an idea of the inferential versus the descriptive. And then we had a little example of the population in the sample as well. Okay, the last thing in this section before we go into the next section is there's a difference between an observational study and a designed experiment. Okay, so what we've done so far in those last two examples, those are just observational studies. Because all we did is we looked and we said, okay, give me the data, let me look at it. And let me see what I observe. So an observational study, we just observe and record. Let's really actually write that down. So observational study. Observe and record. That would be an observational study. The other one is a designed experiment. Let's do designed experiment. And a lot of times we think experiment, we think, you know, oh, somebody's in a laboratory and there's beakers and there's, that, that could be, but it doesn't have to be a designed experiment. But a designed experiment, what happens with a designed experiment is there's some sort of change that the researcher puts in. So researcher... puts in, we'll even say a designed change. And here's an example of that. Say you're a manager of a sandwich shop and you're recording how many people actually come into your sandwich shop and order your new sandwich, the turkey bacon club sandwich. And you just record it. Now that's just going to be an observational study. You're going to say, oh, okay, let's see how many people order this turkey bacon club. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to maybe, maybe it'll be descriptive to say, hey, this many people did it. Maybe you're going to infer and say, hey, let's use this data to find out how much turkey and bacon we need to order for tomorrow and then use it that way. Then it would become inferential. But that's just an observational study. Now, Let's change it a little bit. Let's say, hey, I'm going to put a big sign on the door when people come in, they can't miss it, that says, hey, have you tried our new turkey bacon club sandwich? And you can get pictures of it. You can talk about how delicious it is. You might even have some quotes from people that tried it and said it was fantastic. And now you're going to say, hey, is that going to change how many people come in and buy the sandwich? Well, now it's a designed experiment because we made a change and then observed what happened after that change that we put in. So designed experiment just means the researcher or somebody put in a change and then observed what happens after that. The big thing about a designed experiment, we can determine causation. So causation just means, hey, putting this sign here caused more people to buy that. And I know that because I looked at how many people bought it before I put the sign in. And then I looked at how many people bought it after the sign and there was a change. So I'm thinking that was the cause of the change. Was it necessarily? No, not necessarily. 
it might have just been happenstance that more people bought it after you put that sign up. But you may do it a few different days and we can get into statistical testing later to see if statistically the chances of that actually making the change was because the sign was there or not. And we'll be able to look at that later when we see how we can test these things. Okay, but that's the idea of this first section. We've got two more sections actually we're gonna do in this chapter. We're looking at the first three sections. So the next section, I've got it right here, 1.2, simple random sampling. All right, so let's look at simple random sampling. So we already talked about, if you look at the entire group, it's a census. We already talked about wanting it to be a representative sample. So let's say this, we need a representative sample for our data to be accurate. So say we're looking at the average height of a person in a classroom. And in our sample, all we're doing is we're looking at a group that's basketball players. Well, on average, basketball players are usually taller. Or say in our sample, we're just looking at females. Well, in general, on average, females are shorter than males. Well, is that going to looking at the average height of the females is that going to be representative of the average height in the class? Well, if the class is made up of both males and females, it's probably not. Could it be an average of the class? Yeah, it could be. Is it probably going to be? Probably not and not necessarily. And probabilities don't work in statistics. We are gonna look at how probable something is, but we do know if we get a representative sample, it's more likely that it's gonna represent the population. And so that's what we wanna do. So this section, simple random sampling, we're gonna talk about a couple of different things. So one thing I wanna do is I wanna talk about what a simple random sample is. And what I did is I took a picture and I'm just going to, rather than write this down, I'm going to, let's see, that's not working real well. I'm gonna take this picture and let's see if we can just put it right here. That is the same picture I had before. That is not what I wanted. All right, let's get rid of that. Uh, we'll cut that. Bear with me just a second. All right, so let me copy this and we'll go back and paste it in. Right here. Okay, so this is the idea of simple random sampling. So a simple random sample, a sampling procedure for which each possible sample of a given size is equally likely to be the one obtained. All right. Now, notice it's a simple random sample, a sample obtained by simple random sampling. Probably didn't need to cut and paste that in. That's pretty obvious. But let's, let's talk about what simple random sampling means. Here's a way to take a good random sample. Now notice it says each possible sample of a given size is equally likely to be the one obtained. Now, if I'm doing a lottery and I have 30 ping pong balls with 30 different numbers on them, every different combination of those numbers is equally likely to be selected. If it is equally likely to be selected, that would be a simple random sample. You're just as likely to get, say we're picking three balls, you're just as likely to get balls one, two, and three as you are to get 14, 27, and six. 
they'd be equally likely. So simple random sampling is. Now, if I'm in a classroom and I want to take a sample of 10 students, I can't just say, hey, let's take these 10 students in the front row. That wouldn't make it equally likely because that wasn't equally likely that one person in the front row and one person in the back row and one person in the middle row were all likely to be in the same sample. If I'm taking a group, then they can't be. So a simple random sample, if we're just drawing names out of a hat, that would be a way to do a simple random sample. And so we'll talk about a couple of these. The section 1.3 really talks about three different ways to get a random sample. But a random sample by itself just means everybody in the group's equally likely to be picked. A simple random sample goes one step further and says, okay, every group of size N is equally likely to be picked. All right, and we'll talk about a couple of those. Um, typically, when you do a random sample, one way to do it is to just use a random number generator. So I used to work in public accounting, and one thing we do is we would want to take a sample of the invoices, make sure they were the right amounts, make sure the proper person signed the checks, those sort of things. And we weren't going to look at all of them. So what we would do is we would, num well, they're already numbered, they're invoices. And so we'd say, okay, the first invoice is this number, the last invoice is this number, and we'd go to a computer and we'd say, hey, out of these, randomly select 20 of these. And it would give us 20 invoice numbers, and those are the 20 invoices we'd pull. Very similar to ping pong balls and saying, hey, I'm going to pick the first three ping pong balls that come up. That is a random sample, and it was, in fact, a simple random sample as well. Okay, now, one thing that we have to watch out for with sampling is what they call non-response bias. And with non-response bias, what that means is the people that do not respond to your survey, is there a reason they didn't? Is it a certain group that didn't? And notice with non-response bias, one thing that's going to happen, say you're answering a poll on the internet, and it says, hey, what do you think about whatever? Oranges. Are you a fan of oranges? Now, oranges don't sound very controversial. Um, so let's change it. Let's say, what do you do you like Brussels sprouts? Because some people love Brussels sprouts. Some people hate Brussels sprouts. Well, what's going to happen is some people look at that and say, well, that's stupid. Who cares? And they're not going to answer. Well, that's a non-response. Is there a bias between people that don't respond? Well, one thing that typically happens with non-response bias, who's not going to respond? People that don't care. Who's going to respond? People that have a strong feeling one way or the other. And so with the non-response bias, we have to think about who typically does respond, people with big feelings, who doesn't respond, people that really don't care. And that's something in education we have to look at when we have student evaluations is the students are like, yeah, the teacher's okay. They usually don't say anything. The students that were like, oh, I hated that teacher, they're always going to respond. You're going to get a high percentage of students that were dissatisfied responding, whether it's a teacher, whether it's service in a restaurant, whether it's the quality of a product. You'll have some people that feel strongly in favor of something, and they would be more likely to respond than somebody who's on the fence. Eh, I don't really care. You buy something off of Amazon, for instance, and you're going to get, hey, can you rate this product? Well, if you love the product, you might rate it. If you hated it, you'll definitely rate it. And if you're like, yeah, it's all right, you're like, eh, no, I'm not going to take the time to respond. So you do have to be careful and understand with non-response bias, you've got the people that respond usually feel strongly one way or the other. All right, I'm not going to write anything else there. We'll just leave that there. Now, let's go back to 1.3, or back to it. Let's go forward to 1.3, and we'll talk about these other 
types of sampling designs I was talking about. Because remember, we want it to be a random sample. What's a random sample? Everybody in the population has an equal probability of being selected. Okay, so one of them, and we're just gonna list, we'll list four, but three of them are nice random samples. And again, why do we want it to be random? Because then it's got a higher likelihood of being representative of the population. Okay, so the first one they talk about is systematic random sampling. I'm just gonna call it systematic sampling. And let's just talk about it. So I'll write down a little bit. The idea, and I'm not gonna get into it too much because we're not gonna actually be picking samples this way. But what you do is you look at the group, say you've got 100 people and you wanna select 10 of them. So you say, well, 100 divided by 10 is 10 people. So I'm gonna pick every 10th person. And then what you do is you randomly pick your starting person between one and 10. And then say you pick number three with a random number generator, and then you pick every 10th person after that. So you're like, oh, I'll pick person number three, 13, 23, 33, et cetera. It's the same thing as when you lined up in grade school and the coach would say, hey, we need four teams, the PE teacher. And he or she would say, okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, as they're pointing to different students. And then they say, hey, everybody that's a one, go over here. That's going to be a team. Everybody that's a two, go over there. Threes and fours go this way. That's systematic sampling. So the basics of that is to pick every nth person. And I'm just going to say person generically. It doesn't have to be people. It could be cars or cards or whatever you're dealing with. But that's the idea of the systematic sampling. Another one is what they call cluster sampling. And with cluster sampling, the idea here is that you have a lot of different groups, but each group is pretty much representative of the whole population. And so what you'll do is you'll pick a certain number of clusters, groups, and you'll sample everybody in that cluster. So each cluster or group is representative of the population. Pick some clusters and sample, again, we'll pretend it's people, everyone in each cluster. Now, when I say each cluster, it's each cluster that you picked. So again, say I've got 100 people. We've broken them down into groups of 10 people each. So now I have 10 clusters. Well, now say I want to talk to 30 people. I want 30 people in my sample. Well, then I'm going to pick three of the clusters and talk to all 10 people in each of those three clusters. That'll be my sample of 30. So where this happens, two big places it happens. One is they do this in test marketing. So say you are a nationwide restaurant and you're thinking, you know what? I want to get a brand new menu item. It's going to be a vegetarian taco. You know, like, I don't know if people are gonna to wanna to eat this vegetarian taco. I don't know if enough people are gonna eat it that I can be profitable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go, we'll test market in some regions. So for instance, Seattle's a test market that's commonly used. Tucson's a test market that's typically used. And so what they do is they go into these markets and these markets represent sort of well the population of the United States. So they've got a lot of different socioeconomic backgrounds. They've got a lot of males and females and they can go in and they say, hey, if this works in this city, it'll probably work in the state. 
might even work in the nation. And so test marketing is one way they do that. Another way is say that you're producing light bulbs and you have all these, these cases of light bulbs and there's a thousand light bulbs in each case and you have a hundred cases. So you've got a hundred thousand light bulbs and you're thinking, you know what? I want to sample these to make sure the light bulbs work, but I want to do a sample of say 50 of the light bulbs. Well, you don't want to do systematic sampling and go and say, okay, we're going to pick the fourth light bulb and then every hundredth light bulb or 200th light bulb after that. Now I have to open this box and get this light bulb and open that box and get this light bulb. You may say, these were all made on the same machines. They're all made the same day. Instead of looking at every 200th light bulb, let's go ahead and we'll pick four of the cases and we'll look at all the light bulbs in those four cases. And then the rest of the cases, the rest of the boxes, there's a hundred or thousand. We don't have to look in those because we think this box is going to be representative of the sample. That's another place you could use cluster sampling. I'm just going to say light bulbs. Hopefully that will remind you of that example. And then a third one they often do, don't get this confused with cluster sampling. It sounds similar. It's called stratified sampling. But remember how I said in cluster sampling, each cluster or group is representative of the population. Stratified sampling is just the opposite. In stratified sampling, each group is completely separate of each other. So this time the groups or the strata is what they would call them have different characteristics. So as an example, say it's a presidential election and you're saying, okay, I want to make sure that I talk to all the people that are going to be voting. I want to make sure I get enough Republicans in the sample and I want to make sure I get enough Democrats in the sample and enough independents in the sample. And then within that, maybe I want to make sure I get enough males and enough females. And I want to get enough of this ethnic group and that ethnic group. So we break those up into strata and we make sure we get enough from each strata. Okay, so with stratified sampling, the groups are all different. They may have different races, they may have different economic backgrounds, education backgrounds, they might have different political affiliations. And I wanna make sure that each of those groups is represented in my sample, because again, I want it to be representative of the population. So that's the stratified sampling. And then a fourth one, now those three are all good. Those three were all, these are all random. Random. Pretend that looks like an R, random. Those are all good. Those are all good ways of doing nice random sampling, hopefully getting a sample that looks like the population. Okay, and there's one that is a common one that's not good. It's called a convenient sample. And this one is not random. And so it's not good. You cannot use this to make predictions about the population because since it's not random, it's probably not. And again, is it necessarily? No, but it's probably not representative. of the population. So this is not a good way to do it, but it is a very common way to do it. Because if I said to you, so let's define what this is. Oops, where did I go? If I said to you, hey, I want you to go to campus and I want you to sample 20 people in their regard to if they like going to the beach. Well, who are you going to talk to? You're probably going to talk to 20 people that you run into. 
hey, excuse me, can I ask you a question? And within that, you're only going to talk to the people that are willing to talk to you. That's called a convenience sample, and that's sampling. Well, that's not a very good sampling, is it? You see what that says. Sampling whoever is available. Definitely not random because one, if someone doesn't want to talk to you or someone's not on campus, they have a 0% chance of being asked to be in the sample. So that's not equally likely. Also, it's not random in the fact that, you know, we did one of either systematic cluster stratified sampling. We didn't put names in a hat and only talk to the people that came out. Any of that, there was no random number generator. So convenience sample, not a good one. It is a very common one because it's easy to sample who's available, but not a good way to do it. So anyway, that's kind of the idea of what we're going into. Very definitional today. Chapter one is very definitional because we don't have anything to go into. But starting in chapter two, we're going to look more numerically and we're going to start doing some calculations and I'll show you how to do the calculations. So hang in there, um, read over this, read the text if you'd like to, you have access to the e-text um, and I'll answer questions next time we talk. But other than that, I hope you all have a good day and I will talk to you later.